Well, good morning. Good morning. Um, before I get to um, the call to worship, uh, i just give you guys a little bit of a heads up. Uh, I may or may not be emotional this morning. Probably will. Um, I have um, Shirley and I had our dear friends Harold and Kim are right up here behind Allison. Um, we've, we've known them for a very, very long time. And um, they're going to be moving here, and um, it's been long awaited. And I know it will be great for them and for our church. And so I'm a little overcome this morning. Um, but I know you guys will love them well and, and greet them uh, when you have the chance. So um, it is good to be here with God's people to worship our Lord. So. Um, if you will stand, um, the call to worship is a call and response from Psalm 145. The Lord upholds all who are falling and raises up all who are bowed down. The eyes of all look to you, and you give them their food in due season. You open your hand, you satisfy the desire. The Lord is near to all who call on him, to all who call on him in truth. He fulfills the desire of those who fear him. He also hears their cry and saves them. The Lord preserves all who love him, but all the wicked he will destroy. The mouth will speak the praise of the Lord, and let all flesh bless his holy name forever and ever. Please pray with me. Lord God, we are here this morning to worship you, for you are worthy of it. You are worthy of every bit of our lives. You are worthy of all of our praise and worship. Help us this morning. Help us to put off the distractions, to focus on you, to be able to give you the praise and worship you desire. Holy Spirit, come in and minister to our hearts. Bind up the brokenhearted. Convict of sin. Build up our faith. Help us this morning to worship you well and build your people up in your name. Amen. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, if you heard Kevin's sermon from last Sunday, he referenced a particular worship song that we like to do from time to time. So as is my usual custom of going for low-hanging fruit, we will, <laughs> open, we will open our time of worship this morning by singing Sing to the King, um, but also just emphasizing the verse, for his returning, we watch and we pray, we will be ready the dawn of that day, we'll join in singing with all the redeemed, because Satan is vanquished and Jesus is king. So those are, those aren't just things that we think might happen, that's, that's going to happen, and in a lot of ways it already has happened. So let's, let's sing, let's worship, and let's... Let's celebrate our king who has, um, has, has defeated death and defeated the enemy.
sing that second verse again.
please be seated. Got it? All right. That didn't help my heart or my emotions to calm down at all. But it was wonderful. It was wonderful. Um, so just wanted to share a few announcements about the, uh, the life and vitality of the church. Um, previously, we had a men's Bible study going on. Uh, Greg Wolf was leading that. Matt Hausman is going to be starting that back up again. Uh, that's going to be happening on April 4th. And it's going to be the first and third Mondays of the month. It's going to be 6 o'clock here at the church. Please let Matt know if you want to come because he is going to have food. Right, Matt? Yeah. I'm planning on uh, Costco pizza. Okay. And so uh, I'll, I'll probably have three of them depending on the number of people. So he said if you're, if you're tuning in later or via live stream, he said it's probably going to be some Costco pizza. So if you're coming, let him know. And... Um, would definitely appreciate uh, contributions to cover the, the cost of that. Um, Connect is a ministry for our kids, third grade and up, uh, meets once a month. Uh, they're going to be meeting here at the church uh, April 8th uh, at 6 o'clock. So any kids that are third grade and older, uh, please come. They have times of prayer. There's teaching time. Um, they just have a great time. I think there's snacks involved. Yes. Okay. Um, but for April, no high school. Okay. April, uh, on April 8th, there will be uh, no high school at Connect just for, for this month. Um, next announcement, we have a, an ask of you guys. Um, the communications team can use some help uh, with social media posting, content creation, help with ads. If you can help with this, that would be great. This is an area that we're trying to grow in as a church. We know it's important uh, to uh, reach out to people who aren't in the church and that social media uh, can be a great way to do that. So if you uh, have the desire to do so, if you have the capabilities, we would love to have you as a part of that team. Um, I believe you can contact David Farrell. His email address is also up here. Um, if you don't see David, you can touch base with myself. Liz is also on the team. Um, you can talk with any of the elders, and we can point you to the right person if you don't know uh, who these people are. So I'm going to invite Mark Mborski to come up, and he's got an announcement uh, that he, he wants to share on behalf of the deacons. So. We're not pregnant. <laughs> All right, so as many of you guys know, uh, the fourth Tuesday of every even month is PRM, Peninsula Rescue Mission. We've been serving faithfully there for uh, years now. I, I've lost count. Um, but I just wanted to give you guys a Peninsula Rescue Mission update as far as uh, things needed, maybe what we do there. I, I see some new faces in our congregation. So um, PRM is a men's ministry in downtown Newport News. They serve about anywhere between uh, 30 to, I think, 50 men who are either engaged in a long-term discipleship program, residential discipleship program, or a transient uh, homeless population. Um, transient homeless population can stay there for up to two weeks. They, they guarantee them a bed for up to two weeks. And the long-term discipleship program, there's guys who have been there for years who are being ministered to and growing in their faith. It's a great fantastic ministry that we get to partner with here on the peninsula. Uh, one of the things that uh, the way that we primarily serve is we show up, like I said, fourth Tuesday of every even month about at 445. We help prepare a meal most of, most of the time. The food is already cooked and we help plate it. We help clean up. We help deliver the plates to the men, um, get to share a kind word, pray with them if, if there's opportunity. Uh, and, and then we help clean up. Um, and it's just, it's, it's easy. It's a way for us to love on, on our community. It's a way for us to serve those um, who the Lord has called us to serve as Christians. So uh, a couple of updates. It's getting warmer. 
And this is something that they've sent out to us, or at least to me, as just kind of to relay to you guys. It's getting warmer. It is a, uh, a kitchen atmosphere, so if you are coming to serve, please no open-toed shoes, no sleeveless shirts. Um, ladies, it's a men's ministry. Please be mindful of what you're wearing. Think no yoga pants. Think no short shorts. Just to help protect the, the hearts and the minds of the men who serve there, please. A um, couple of needs that they have right now, the physical, tangible needs, individually wrapped snacks, bottles of water, it's getting warmer, travel tissue packs, it's cold and allergy season, um, and travel shaving cream. Now these things, the address, the address is up on the realm, I believe it's 4700 Huntington Avenue. Uh, the, these things can be Amazon to them. If you guys are Amazon shoppers and you want to serve, you can plug their address in and have it sent directly to them. Make it easy. If you, if you would opt not to do that, I work at the shipyard. My car is literally parked 150 yards from their building. And you can come, come drop it off here at the church, and I can get it to them. So if you have a desire to serve, if you want to meet some of these needs, uh, bring it to church or send it, send it to them directly. I'm happy to help. Um, finally, uh, if you would like to sign up, there is a sign-up sheet. Outside the kitchen, outside the kitchen door, it's got slots. We need, at most, maybe six, seven people. Uh, it's helpful to have more than two. So if you see an open spot, put your name there. Um, if, you, if you need directions, need more information, come find me. I'm happy to, happy to talk. I've been doing this for years. It's a great ministry. Um, but yeah, keep them in prayer as they, as they serve these men. All right? Right. I, I believe the, the ask is that the uh, that 14, 14 and up uh, come smaller children. Um, they ask that, that we not bring them yet. There's uh, there's volunteer forms um, out in the lobby as well as the Senate. Anybody else? All right. Thanks, guys. Um, if you do bring um, items to the church for PRM, there is a basket right beside the kitchen door there. You can drop it in that basket. If that basket is full, um, then just set it beside the basket. We'll make sure that it gets to where it needs to go. We also use that basket for uh, care net needs. So if you see baby stuff in there, you're like, is this the right spot? Yes, it's the right spot for the PRM stuff as well. Yep. So. All right, um, so as a church um, this year, the elders are trying to encourage everyone to pray more, to pray more on a daily basis. These sheets are on the high top right outside the double doors. Um, it's just kind of a diagram that we came up with uh, to help you each day to pray for kind of a different group of people. And then each week we send out a different theme or a topic that fits in with each of those uh, groups of people. So we've been working through the fruit of the Spirit, praying that the fruit of the Spirit would uh, be manifest in different groups like uh, our family, our church, friends and relatives, and then it goes all the way out to world and missions. Um, and so if you haven't grabbed one of these, grab one of these. Um, this week we'll be praying through the, the last of the fruit of the Spirit, which is self-control. Um, and so uh, this morning, uh, the prayer um, is uh, entitled, Come Holy Spirit. Uh, this is from Piercing Heaven, which are prayers of the Puritans. So um, it's not a long prayer. Our, our God doesn't require long prayers, but we want to worship him in spirit and truth. We want to lift up hearts that are um, authentic to our God. So um, please pray with me now. Come, Holy Spirit, with all your sweet and precious favor. Come, Lord, to convince and comfort me, to humble and direct me, to chill our affections to the world and to warm them toward the Lord Jesus. Come, you holy, gracious, almighty reviver and restorer and glorifier of my God and Savior. 
cause the graces you have planted in us to go forth in a way of love and desire, faith and expectation. Let us hope in the person and glory of the one who our souls love. In your name, amen. Amen. Um, At this time, children are dismissed to Children's Church. They're going to continue their worship in there with their teachers. Their teachers will be in the lobby um, as we continue our worship in here through song. Uh, Also, uh, as a reminder, we're not passing the basket at this time yet. Uh, So if you have tithes or offerings, there is a basket on the high top just outside the double doors. I love the the chaos that ensues when all of the kids just go out. And the sound is a joyful sound because we have so many. So we praise God for that. Um, let's, Let's stand and continue our worship and song.
All right. Welcome once again to By Grace. We're thrilled that all of you are here to worship with us. If you have your Bibles with you, I invite you to open up to the book of 2 Samuel. Today we're going to continue our journey in chapter 3. This is God's Word. May we hear it and receive it as such. The very words of God. 2 Samuel 3, beginning in verse 1. There was a long war between the house of Saul and the house of David. And David grew stronger and stronger, while the house of Saul became weaker and weaker. And sons were born to David at Hebron. His firstborn was Amnon of Ahinoam of Jezreel. And his second, Chileab of Abigail, the widow of Nabal of Carmel. Third, Absalom, the son of Makkah, the daughter of Talmai, king of Geshur. And the fourth, Adonijah, the son of Haggith. The fifth, Stephatia, the son of Abital. And the sixth, Ithrium of Egla, David's wife. These were born to David in Hebron. While there was war between the house of Saul and the house of David, Abner was making himself strong in the house of Saul. Now Saul had a concubine whose name was Rispa, the daughter of Aya, and Ishbosheth said to Abner, Why have you gone into my father's concubine? Then Abner was very angry over the words of Ishbosheth and said, Am I a dog's head of Judah? To this day I keep showing steadfast love to the house of Saul, your father to his brothers and to his friends, and have not given you into the hand of David. And yet, you charge me today with a fault concerning a woman. God, do do so to Abner and more also, if I do not accomplish for David what Yahweh has sworn to him, to transfer the kingdom from the house of Saul and set up the throne of David over Israel, over Judah, from Dan to Beersheba. Nishboash, Ishbosheth, should not answer Abner another word. He couldn't, because he feared him. And Abner sent messengers to David on his behalf, saying, To whom does the land belong? Make your covenant with me, and behold, my hand shall be with you, to bring over all Israel to you. And he said, Good, I'll make a covenant with you. But one thing I require of you, that is, You shall not see my face unless you first bring Michael, Saul's daughter, when you come to see my face. Then David sent messengers to Ishbosheth, Saul's son, saying, Give me my wife, Michael, for whom I paid the bridal price of a hundred foreskins of the Philistines. And Ishbosheth sent and took her from her husband, Paul Teal, the son of Laish. But her husband went to her, weeping. After her, all the way to Baharim. Then Abner said to him, Go, return. And he returned. And Abner conferred with the elders of Israel, saying, For some time past, you've been seeking David as king over you. Now then, bring it about. For Yahweh has promised David, saying, quote, By the hand of my servant David, I will save my people Israel from the hand of the Philistines and from the hand of all their enemies. Close quote. Abner also spoke to Benjamin. And then Abner went to tell David at Hebron all that Israel and the whole house of Benjamin thought good to do. When Abner came with 20 men to David at Hebron, David made a feast for Abner and the men who were with him. And Abner said to David, I will arise and go and will gather all Israel to my lord the king that they may make a covenant with you and that you may reign over all that your heart desires. So David sent Abner away, and he went in peace. Please pray with me. Heavenly Father, we come. We come in peace. Because you have established peace with us through the work of your Son. Father, we're grateful this morning. We delight in singing your praises We're grateful for the life and death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. 
We're grateful for the eternal plans that are unfolding in our ordinary and everyday lives. Sometimes it's overwhelming to see you at work in us and through us. Father, we ask that you would continue that work today. That as we gather together, as we sing, as we hear your word preached, Father, renew and strengthen the weary. Give grace and humility to the proud. Give strength to the weak. Give voice to those who are silenced. Father, give us the joy of our salvation. Renewed in Christ, we ask in his name. And all God's people agree. Two kings, one throne. That's where we are in this tale. Two kings, one throne. David, who's already the anointed king, has been chosen by Judah. And they've installed him as king in Judah. Abner, however, the great general of Saul, who, by the way, didn't die when Saul died. If you haven't caught on to that yet, how does Saul's great general and bodyguard not die when Saul dies? Curious. Abner has chosen Saul's other son, Ishbosheth, to be king. He is, for all practical purposes, a puppet king. Although today, he's going to get a small voice. He's going to push back just a little bit against Abner's tyranny over Israel. But let's remember, Abner may have chosen Ishbosheth, and Judah may have chosen the Lord's anointed David. But God has chosen David. A long time ago, God chose David. And so what we see is the unfolding of the kingdom of David. But let's remember that it's not really about the kingdom of David. It's about the kingdom of David's greater son, who's going to come a thousand years later. The dynasty that's really important here is not the line of David beyond It's genealogical ancestry and development for Jesus to come as a true son of David. So God is unfolding an eternal plan of redemption and David's kingdom as it unfolds is a type of the one to come. But it will have flaws. David as king will have flaws. But in the ultimate kingdom that this kingdom points to, no flaws. No flaws in the kingdom, no flaws in the king, and eventually, whet your appetite on this thought, no flaws in the citizens of that kingdom. So keep your eyes on David, keep your eyes on David's kingdom, sure. But ultimately, look for the hand and movement and word of God as it's unfolding this plan. So Israel might be struggling in battle with one another. Two kings, one throne. But there is a king over Israel. And there are kings to come. David is the one that God has chosen. So as we begin in verse 1, we see that there is what the narrator here calls a long war between the house of Saul and the house of David. This is interesting for us as we begin because a long war usually indicates constant battles, constant skirmishes. Constant warfare. So some of what we have to understand here in verse 1 is that there will be actual battles. There have and there are more to come. But really, this is much more like a family dispute living in a continuing state of hostility. 
Think of the Cold War in American and Russian history. And I know that's a sensitive topic today, but we didn't fight a lot of battles with swords and shields or guns and tanks against Russia. We fought in other ways using other means. But the hostility was high. And we were, for all practical purposes, at war. America against Russia. So you can have a prolonged war with not so many battles. And so I want to give you that up front because I think the narrator is trying to help us understand that over the course of these seven years, as David is ruling in Hebron, that there are fights. We read about one last week. But there's also tension and anger and division and political maneuvering. And that's the central element of what we're going to see today. We saw Abner's failure in his aggression last week. Today, we're going to see Abner's failure in his political maneuvering and savvy. Israel is divided. Poor little Judah set against all his brother tribes. King David against everybody else. And so, there may have been this long war, these great hostilities. But in the course of these events, we get, at the end of verse 1, the summary of all the events that are coming. David is growing stronger and stronger while the house of Saul becomes weaker and weaker. There's your meta theme. You want to know what's happening in the the passages to follow? You're going to see David grow stronger and stronger you're going to see the house of Saul grow weaker and weaker. So we must ask the question, what does the author mean when he says David grew stronger? It's going to be David's strength will be tied to two realities. The first is that he will have more marriages. He will have more marriages. We'll see that in a second. And then also we will see his growing family of sons. So it's not just the marital unions that will take place, we'll talk about that a lot today, but also having sons from those marriages personalizes the relationship. Everybody loves their grandkid, right? Takes a lot for a grandparent to look at the kid and be like, meh. So if your grandparents are looking at you saying, meh, you better work on your obedience. Just pro tip for you little ones. The relationship gets personalized and embodied. And when it's embodied, it is stronger in affection. It is stronger in the desire to protect and pass on. So David is going to grow stronger politically through this growing family, more wives and more sons. It's a historic pattern that you see alive and well in their day. Second, Abner's going to lead Saul's house into weakness. They will become weaker and weaker. Why? I offer you the classic quartet to borrow a metaphor from musicians. There are four realities that Abner is going to pursue here that will lead to the weakening of Saul's house. The first we've tasted already, and that is unholy ambition. Second, this will not surprise you, sex. Third, power plays. And fourth, political maneuvering. Abner will fail in every category here. Ambition, sex, power, and politics. Classic quartet. In fact, if you were going to film a story or a movie or a TV series back in the day, I guarantee you there would be cards, index cards, or writings on whiteboards as they're crafting the master plan to say, where's our ambition going to be? 
Where's our sex going to be? Who's in power? Who's gaining power? Who's losing power? And what surprising political maneuvering can we invent, create, or rip off? There's nothing new under the sun, yes? The question is, how are they going to do these things? Not, will there be these things, right? There's always going to be ambition and sex and power and politics. Abner's going to make Saul's house weaker through failure in all four of these classic categories. So let's wade into this a little bit. Here we're going to see David, and he's going to have sons. Verse 2, I promised you a growing family. In verse 2, we see that David had a son born to him during his reign in Hebron, and his firstborn son's name is Amnon, and he is of the wife Jezreel. I have a quote for us from a commentator because I, I didn't want to divide it up or play it off. So listen to, the, listen to one commentator here. He says, For anyone who knows what lies ahead for David, referencing this moment, the list of sons is disturbing. There are names here that we will hear again. They will be the cause of much pain and terrible trouble for David and his family. He goes on. His firstborn was Amnon of Jezreel. Ahinoam was one of the two wives David had brought with him to Hebron. This first son of David will appear again in the story years later. His shocking and wayward behavior then, referencing the incestuous rape of his half-sister Tamar, which we'll see in chapter 13, will play a major role in the disastrous and bloody family feud that will all but destroy David's family and his kingdom. Tune in. Amnon will be murdered by his own half-brother, who will then attempt to overthrow his father as king, meeting his own death in the ensuing conflict. You get to read about that in chapters 14 through 18. The story of David's firstborn son will not be a happy one. However, all this lies in the future. What I appreciate about what the commentator's doing here is he's not just walking us through who these sons are and how the family tree works. He's trying to help us enter into the Hebraic cultural response to this being in their history. This is the history of their kingdom. This is the history of their family. So when you hear these names, if they appear later in the stories you will be emotionally crushed by the devastation caused through these children, these sons, these marriages. And this is true for most of the sons listed. I won't go through each one. But I want you to understand that when we talk about David's growing families, it is a human endeavor to create human treaties through marriage and the procreation of children to assimilate loyalty into the family. But this was not God's best design. In fact, there's a warning all the way back in the book of the covenant in Deuteronomy chapter 17. Verse 17, tell me if this doesn't hit it right on the nose. God says to his people, speaking about a future king in Israel, he says this, chapter 17, verse 17 of Deuteronomy, and he shall not acquire many wives for himself, lest his heart turn away, nor shall he acquire for himself excessive silver or gold. I mean, if you were to look up excessive silver and gold in a dictionary, whose picture? Who's Solomon? David's son. So David is going to create a pattern that his son multiplies 
exponentially in disobedience to God's clear, any ambiguity in that verse? Clear command. So let me take a pastoral time out for a moment. How many of you have thought in your heart, I just wish God would speak to me because I would obey? <laughs> I just want to hear the voice of God give me clear direction because then it would be easy to obey. <laughs> The, the Bible just shouts back at us, uh-uh, <laughs> no, not remotely is that true. You have the word of God and it sits dusty in the corner shelf of your bookshelf perhaps, or it's right there on your nightstand so you can put your glasses on it at the end of the day. God speaks clearly and man rebels. God speaks clearly, and we ignore. God speaks clearly, and we don't care. That is the most common reality. Don't acquire many wives. Don't do it. Your heart will be double-minded quadruple-minded. David's failure is very much tied to his desire to bring about the kingdom of God the way the world does. But this is not a worldly kingdom. This is why Pilate was not afraid of Jesus. Because as they're conversing, Pilate is asking him questions about the Roman Empire and the Jewish ruling authorities. And Jesus is laughing because he knows that his kingdom is so much bigger than anything Pilate could fathom. Anything that Caesar might claim as his own. Jesus' view of the unfolding kingdom of God was so different, it was unrecognizable to Pilate under close examination. So much so that Pilate concludes what? <laughs> no guilt in that guy. Of all the threats that are around here, <laughs> it ain't him. Roman Empire is where now? And the church is where now? Yeah, David's trying to grow his own kingdom the way everybody grows his own kingdom. And it will lead to misery. Misery, anguish, bloodshed. So as we think about the naming of all these sons and the introduction of new wives, it is important for us to begin to understand this unfolding plan that David has, that David's counselors are giving him, that, that this is how we grow the kingdom. And so we get at verse 5, the end of the sixth son, we get there, these were the ones who were born to David in Hebron. Okay, so that's the summary on David's side of his kingdom as he seeks one throne. Verse 6, while there was war between the house of Saul and the house of David, again, this hostility, this warfare, these battles... Abner was making himself strong in the house of Saul. The language here is very specific. Saul's house is getting weaker. And Abner himself is getting stronger. You're supposed to see the inverted nature of their relationship. That as Abner grows in strength, Saul's household gets weaker and weaker and weaker. But make no mistake, Abner is a man of action. That's imaged in this verse 6. Abner was what? Making himself strong. Abner didn't care about Saul. Abner didn't care about Saul's legacy or dynasty. 
He cared about himself. Classic plot point, yes? Classic human experience. My highest loyalty is to me or God? Who has your highest loyalty? Where do you spend your time? Where do you spend your money? Where do you lose sleep? These are ways of accessing what you really love. Where your highest allegiances are. Abner's allegiance is to himself. So he makes himself strong. Verse 7. Now Saul had a concubine whose name was Rispa, the daughter of Aya, and Ishbosheth says to Abner. So here's the scene. Abner is politically growing in power, in importance, in savvy, and he oversteps himself a little bit because he takes Saul's concubine, dead Saul, takes his concubine for himself. Now, praise God, we don't live in a culture with concubines, but part of what's happening here is that if you bring into your own bedroom or go into her bedroom someone's concubine, then you are asserting yourself as the new person over her tied to her. So if you take a king's concubine, you are assaulting and claiming the throne for yourself. Abner here is ignoring the puppet king that he's placed and is instead exercising and acting as if he was the king who had all the rights that the previous king had. In other words, taking Saul's concubine is a step towards taking Saul's throne. But I grieve here. In fact, most of the time, I'm embarrassed to talk about marriage and concubines in the Old Testament. I don't know if you've ever been in a moment where you're sharing your faith and people are like, yeah, but God doesn't really care about monogamy. God doesn't really say, hold sex for marriage. He doesn't really, right? You ever been in a conversation? And they point to the idiots in the Old Testament who destroyed their own lives often Saved by grace, but certainly not by effort. They tie themselves up in knots and they deny God and God's design. So I wish, hear me clearly, the practice of polygamy and concubines in the Old Testament receives less attention by the biblical narrators than I want. I want them to condemn it in a sentence. And instead, they condemn it in generational story. This is because we are Greeks. We want it summarized. We want it footnoted. We want it articulated clearly. And every Hebrew grandmother who tells the story of Joseph or Jacob or David points out all the failures, all the flaws, all the troubles that happen, which lead to the lesson, bad. But the practice of polygamy, the use of concubines, it just receives less attention by the biblical narrators than I want. But it is not absent. It is not hidden. It is just not obvious and overwhelming. So consider this. Solomon had 700 wives and added to that 300 concubines. Solomon's son, Rehoboam, will have 18 wives. And only, I say in jest, 60 concubines. 
Sanctification's awesome, isn't it? Good. Don't take the bait on that. All of it is broken. All of it is rooted in power, abuse, perversion. All of it is against God's design. God has designed sex and marriage for monogamy. It has always been true. Genesis 2.24, Matthew 19, verses 4 through 6, and 1 Timothy 3.2 are places you can begin if you want to study what the Bible really does say about monogamy. So do not think that I talk about concubines lightly. Don't think that I or any pastor you can trust who teaches the Bible carefully, patiently, nuanced, thinks that polygamy is no big deal. There's no good version of polygamy in the Bible. You won't find it. Is that enough? Anything vague there? Okay, let's keep marching. So, Abner walks in, makes use of Saul's former concubine, whose name is given to us, and he gets caught. We don't know that this is the first time, this could be the first time of just getting caught. There could have been many interactions before this. The events of these passages take care, take, happen over the course of many years. But Abner, a particular time, goes in and spends time with her and then comes out. And on the way out, Ishbosheth, his puppet king, says to Abner, here's the challenge, why have you gone into my father's concubine? It's a pretty simple question. <laughs> why would you go in there? We play chess. <laughs> we were going to study poetry together. Why on earth did you think you had the right to go into her bedroom? That's the real king in Israel talking to the one who's pulling his strings. Verse 8. Abner was very, very sorry. Is that what we get? Abner knew he was caught and had no way out so he just told the truth. <laughs> That's not humanity, right? Let me get very angry, very, very angry. What made him so angry? The words that Ishbosheth spoke to him. <laughs> no, it's getting caught. Can we be clear? It's getting caught. Using and doing something you do not have the right to. But Abner's response is not confession. Abner instead offers outrage. He doesn't even offer denial. You catch that? He doesn't say, I didn't do anything wrong. He's just going to be outraged and anger. So he talks about what he does do, and he talks about what he hasn't yet done, and both of them are threats. Make no mistake, as this is unfolding for us, Abner is going to challenge the puppet king. And because of this interaction, he's actually going to switch sides. He gets so mad that the puppet king would dare talk back to him as he utilizes the rights of kings, that he's going to switch sides. Listen to Abner. Am I a dog's head of Judah? To this day, I keep showing steadfast love to the house of Saul, your father. Uh, you do? Because Saul's house is getting weaker and you're getting stronger. But it's easy to lay the claim. I've done nothing but loyal. That's his objection. I caught you doing what you shouldn't do. Yeah, but I'm loyal. Wait, run that back. I caught you doing what you shouldn't do. It's an affront to me. It's a desecration of my father and his legacy. And your response is, I've done nothing but love the house of Saul? Uh, president, present evidence says otherwise. 
You don't love Saul, you love yourself. Duh. It's a threat. I've done nothing but love the house of Saul, the house of your father, his brothers, his friends. And then the warning about what he has not yet done and is about to do now. I have not given you into the hand of David. I didn't know that was on the table. Right? I didn't. I, oh, you were wondering about that? I thought you were loyal and loving to my house, to Saul, my father. I thought this was about us and all the tribes. We're 11 for 12. All the power should be on our side. I haven't given you over to the hands of David. And you dare charge me today with a fault concerning a woman? Sorry, ladies. Abner doesn't value you. Because this is a prized lady. This is an elite lady. And he calls her just a woman. This is not just any old woman. And then he goes into an oath. Verse 9. May God do to Abner and more if I do not accomplish for David what Yahweh has sworn to him. You see, he switched his sides instantly. He gets caught doing evil, and his immediate response is, well, I'm on the other team now. That's childish, yes. Taking my ball, and I'm going home. Taking my strength and my power, and I'm giving it to David. And God accomplish for David everything that he's sworn to him to do. Uh, God doesn't need Abner to bring this about. I mean, I think Abner doesn't realize this. Because he's a man of action, he'll make it happen. So what's Abner going to do? He's going to transfer the power of the kingdom from the house of Saul. He's going to set up a throne of David over Israel and over Judah. As far as Dan to Beersheba, from north to south. And then we get verse 11. Ishbosheth could not answer Abner another word. Why? 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 Fear. He feared him. The strong man silences the weak man. The strong man silences the weak man. How do you use your power? How do you use your influence? How do you react when you're caught in sin? How does your heart lead you when you know that you're in the wrong, but you can tie them up with your wit? You can corner them and shame them when it's you who belong in the corner. It's you who are ignoring your own shame, placing it upon others. Fathers, I got to say, man, this broke my heart all week to think of times where I may have argued my daughters into a corner and caused them to no longer object because I'm the strong man and they're the weak one. How do you lead your family? How do you love your kids? How do you love the powerless? Do you give voice to those who cannot speak for themselves? It's like a dagger in my heart. Strong man unsurprisingly silences the weaker man. May it not be so in the kingdom of God. So, Let's do this quickly. Abner sends messengers to David on his behalf. Verse 12, to whom does the land belong? Make your covenant with me. I love Abner's humility. And behold, my hand shall be with you to bring over all Israel to you. Abner really believes that he's the one who's going to do what God wants. Can you see the arrogance of Abner? 
He has been plotting David's downfall, gets caught in sin, jumps ship, switch sides, and immediately promises to do for David that which only God is able to do. Abner is his own God to his own destruction. Make your covenant with me, and I'll give you Israel. Verse 13, David's response, good. Okay, sounds good. I will make a covenant with you, but I have one requirement. That is that you shall not see my face unless you first bring my first wife back to me. David wants Saul's daughter, Michael, who remember Saul took away from him, for whom he prayed paid the bridal price of a hundred foreskins. How many did he actually deliver? Do you remember? 200. He was very eager to marry her. He wants her back. Now let's be clear. This is not just romance. David is not just wanting her back so that they have an affectionate life long, just the two of them forever. We know that. David has a conditional acceptance. Give me back Michael. Remember, wives serve political ends, and so do sons. And if you wanted to humanly squash the fighting between the house of David and the house of Saul, a son born from David and Michael would unite the house of Saul and David ever after. But God said Saul's dynasty ends. They will never have a son. They will never have this union the way that he imagines it or plans it or plots it. So there's the condition, Abner's Scott. So David then, after immediately uh, bartering with Abner and explaining his requirements, verse 14, David sent messengers to Ishbosheth himself. This is brilliant on David's part. David completely undercuts Abner's power because Abner's not the only one who knows the condition. So anybody can bring Michael back to David, the king, most easily, and that will establish it. So David is, you know, kind of beautifully wise here in undercutting Abner's power. Let's keep rolling. In verse 15, Ishbosheth then sends for her and takes her from the husband that Saul had given her to after she was with David. Paltiel. Verse 16 should make you weep. I know we don't have time. But her husband trails behind her journey. He loves her. This is what marriage is supposed to look like. But politics and human scheming shred and destroy this otherwise seemingly beautiful union. Her husband follows after her, weeping the whole way. And then Abner has to order the husband to leave because she's being returned to David. So then Abner confers with all the elders of Israel. These are the elder tribes. And he says, some time passed. You guys have been seeking David as king over you. Hey, guess what? I can give it to you. Verse 18. Now then, bring it about. For Yahweh has promised David, saying, By the hand of my servant David, I will save my people Israel from the hand of the Philistines and from the hand of all their enemies. Whoa! Abner knew what God had said all along. And now it's politically convenient for him, so he'll quote the scripture. Let's try that again. Abner knew that God had promised David the kingship. So he quotes scripture only when it suited his agenda. Otherwise, he's free to ignore it. Y'all better let that sink in. You want part of the scripture? You want the inspiration of the scripture? You want the positive songs that K-Love can give you? Or do you want the whole counsel of God? There's lots of bad news. But that bad news serves to make the good news spectacular. Abner quotes scripture only when it suits his agenda. And now it does. So verse 18. Verse 19. Abner also spoke to Benjamin. And then Abner went to tell David at Hebron 
all that Israel, the whole house of Benjamin, thought good to do. You get it? All the political maneuverings done. All the war is coming to a close. The tensions and the hostilities, they're dying down. They have Michael. David gets his first wife back. And then Abner approaches, having met the condition. Verse 20 blows me away. When Abner came with 20 men to David at Hebron, David made a feast for Abner and the men who were with him. This guy carried on all of the hostility that Saul had shown David. He had plotted against him. He had warred against him. He had physically battled troops against troops. David's nephew died at his hand. And David welcomes him with a feast. That's the grace of the kingdom of heaven. That's the goodness of God towards you. Are you not a rebel on your own, left to yourself, if God had not intervened and rescued you? Were you not a rebel against his kingdom? Were you not waging war as your own little fiefdom could grow? Were you not a demigod in your own eyes, doing as you please, taking what you want, manipulating others to get what you want? Husbands and wives should pay attention to that one. Manipulating each other to get what you want, trading and brokering. Are you not born hostile to God? And because of Christ, his righteous life, his atoning death, the victorious power of his glorious resurrection, are you not welcomed to feast at his table? How does a rebel leader have peace with the true king? They get decapitated, not fed. The kingdom of heaven is different. The kingdom of heaven is different. Notice there's never a confession of sin from Abner. He never confesses his failures. There is no repentance here. Just political maneuvering and yet David surprisingly graciously generously unexpectedly welcomes him to his table y'all this is what God in Christ has done listen to the apostle Paul in Romans 5 verse 1 and then jumping ahead to verses 8 through 11 therefore since we have been justified by faith we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Drop your eye to verse 8. But God shows his love for us and that while we were still sinners, you can read enemies there. Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. Jesus took our wrath. And God holds no hostility towards you anymore if you are in Christ. Verse 10, for if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more, much more, now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life? More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received Reconciliation. Rebels feasting at his table as loyal citizens. Miraculous. Mesmerizing. Unexpected. So what's the theological witness of this text? It's that former rebels can find peace. Rebels can be reconciled to their king and make known to the world that watches that we who are in Christ have peace with God. Peace with God. Amen? Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the peace 
that you give that can only come through Jesus. Father, we are grateful that you love us and that you offer yourself as a substitute for us. Lord, forgive us for the times where we are strong and we silence the weak. Forgive us for the times where marriage or friendship is about political maneuvering to get what we want. Forgive us, O oh Lord, for the times where we look at other people as useful instead of calling us to serve them. Father, forgive us for the ways that we expand our influence on our own terms for our own glory. Father God, come and heal us. Come and restore us. Come and strengthen our unions, strengthen our friendships, strengthen our marriages, strengthen our families, strengthen our church and our small groups. God, we ask that you would come and make yourself known and give us opportunity this very week to speak of the peace of God given to us in Jesus Christ. We ask this and more in the name of our Savior and our Redeemer. And all God's people agree. Amen. We invite those of you who are able to stand as we sing in response. Also, parents, please head to the lobby and pick your children up from Children's Church at this time.
the crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. Save my soul. I am yours forevermore. I won't be moved of this, I'm sure. You are my God and you save my soul. was dead is now alive. You gave to me the breath of life. You brought me up out from the grave. I'm bursting out with songs of praise. I'm bursting out with songs of praise. I'm bursting out with songs of praise. Overtime. <laughs> yes. Sometimes in sports and other things, overtime, gosh, but overtime, yes. Um, so this month our call to worship was uh, a chunk of Psalm 145, and last month we learned a new song based on Psalm 145, so I thought it was very appropriate to, appropriate to close out our worship today, the last Sunday of the month, singing that song that is based on the same scripture that our call to worship came from. 
So we invite you to join us in singing How Great. No, no problem. So um, when you practice something and then four hours later you then have to sit down and do it cold, it just always doesn't always happen. So we're just going to do it again. <laughs> yeah, we don't have the hard job. He has the hard job.
After feasting, David sent Abner away, and he went in peace. It's a picture of the gospel for us. Our benediction today comes from Romans chapter 15. For all those who are able, please stand or remain standing. Child of God, receive your Father's blessing. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. And all God's people agree. Amen. Amen. Amen.